Well, good morning, everybody. You guys are so good on time. It's awesome. <clears throat> You're probably like me in that I forgot that it was daylight savings time. Daylight savings. Had an hour to spare. As I'm walking out of the house, it's like 10 minutes to 8, apparently. Well, good morning. If you're here for the first time, a special welcome. I'd like to open up in prayer. Before I do that, I want to share with you a couple of verses that God's been ministering to me these last few weeks. If you, if you have time on Wednesday nights, we have a midweek Bible study. We've been going through the book of Romans. <clears throat> and right now we're in Romans chapter 8. And there's just some real nuggets in this chapter not to say the least of which is a section that Pastor Chuck one time said literally uh, revolutionized his life. And um, he literally says that it changed his life 180 degrees from his understanding of his relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> and so chapter 8 is really just filled with a lot of meat and nuggets of glorious verses. I want to read to you a few of them here, and they're out of order, but um, I'm just going to read them to you. Uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to His purpose. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And it is written, for thy sake that we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today is also National International Day of Prayer, and it's a time set aside to pray for those that are persecuted for Christ's sake. I doubt it that any of us here today are persecuted for Christ's sake like those in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, I should say. Those that are being thrown in prison or again, persecuted because they share their faith and being accused of, quote-unquote, shaking the faith of the Muslims. Again, I doubt it if any of us are, can be accused of that. But as we open up this morning, let's pray for those that are in need, those that are in other countries, other parts of the world that are being persecuted mm -hmm. for their faith and for what they believe in. And then let the Holy Spirit just convict us yeah. Let Him work in our hearts. Let Him convict us for what we need to do in our faith as we truly do need to be um, accused of sharing our faith. And if we were on trial today, would we be guilty or innocent for sharing our faith? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we need to go out in the street corners and stand up there with a the Bible and start thumping on people, although that may not be a bad idea for some. But you know, we really should be not ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for this day once again that you've given us another beautiful day, Lord. God, where we can breathe the very breath that you've given us. Lord, it is only by you that we are able to sustain ourselves. And to even think, God, that we can sustain ourselves is even foolish, God, because it's only you that keeps us together. Yes. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for those that are here this morning. We pray for those that are on their way, Lord, that you would help them to get here safely. We pray that the enemy would not prevail, even in the midst of their travels, or even Jesus. if they're at home right now still trying to get ready or arguing on the way to church. Lord, whatever might be happening right now, Lord, we pray for those saints. And we pray for those here, Lord, that you would just be in our midst this morning, God. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would roam in this place, 
that you would have your way in our hearts, that you would have your way in our lives. Lord, as your word says that we should be led by the Spirit, God, help us to act that way. Yes. That we are being led by you. This morning we pray, God, that you would just have your way with the children. We pray, God, that you would be with each and every one of them, God, be in the classrooms. Yes. Lord, I pray for the teachers that are going to be teaching the children this morning as well, Lord, mm -hmm. that you would just continue to fill them with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, may the children, God, be ministered to. May they come to a better knowledge of you, Lord. And God, I pray that as parents, God, that we can just learn from them. Lord, how they have that childlike faith that you've called us to have, that we can learn from them, Lord. And then, Lord, I pray for each and every heart that's here in here this morning. Lord, that you would minister to our hearts, God, through the message that's going to go forth. That you would fill Pastor Jason, Lord, with your Holy yes. Spirit. That he would bring forth your word. Yes, Jesus. And that we would be like Samuel, God, and just say, Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Minister to our hearts that we would leave differently than how we came. And we pray for this time of worship right now, Lord. As we enter into this time, Lord, we pray that you would be pleased. God, that the words that we sing won't just be words on the screen. God, but they would be words from our hearts. Lord, that we would even cry out to you, Lord as our spirit, God, groans for you, Lord, minister to us. May this be a time of worship, God, that you would just be pleased and in the end, God, you would receive it as a sweet smell of aroma before your throne and that you would say, well done. We thank you, God. We do pray, Lord, for those in this world, God, that are being persecuted for you. Lord, we in this country are so blessed and we don't even realize it. Lord, we do pray, God, for those that are shaking the lives of other people, Lord, through them spreading the gospel. Lord, protect them. God, help them to have your peace in their lives. Help them, God, to understand that they are secure in you and that what man can do to them, God, is nothing. Lord, for this present sufferings, God, is nothing compared to the glory that you have in store for us and for them. Again, God, we thank you. We give you all the glory, God, and all the honor and all the praise, God, because only you deserve it. And together we said, amen. Jesus. And Jesus alone is mighty to save. Heaven needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of Savior, the hope of nations. He is the Savior. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me All my fears and failures I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Surrender, no, I surrender all. He is Savior, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave.
Savior. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Savior. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Strike us down with your love, Lord Jesus. Your grace and your mercies in light of your truth. Start now, Lord. Begin with us now. We grumble and we, we chastise the world and the sinners. Lest we forget, church, we started it all. You and I are the premier sinners of our lives. Only by His grace and mercy and compassion can we be delivered from ourselves. This morning is Communion Sunday and uh, we also, Jason's going to share about a little event we're going to do after church. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside. The sound of angels' song, the sound of angels' songs, all this for a king. We could join and sing. All to Christ the King How constant, how divine The song of ours will ride How constant, how divine This love of ours will rise, will rise Oh, oh, praise Him And raise a joyous noise. The sound of salvation comes, the sound of rescued ones, all this for a king. Angels join to sing, all for Christ our King.
how infinite and sweet this love so rescuing how infinitely sweet this great love that's redeemed as one we sing seeing the presence of God, the God of heaven, third heaven. If you are saved today, if you know Jesus today, he is in you, and at this time, his Holy Spirit desires to come upon you. Would you allow him to do that? He is worthy to be praised. He is the God of amazing grace. It covers me, 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 it covers me,
You're amazing. Your grace, you're amazing. Jesus, you're amazing. Ushers, please come forward. We want to welcome visitors, those who are searching for a church that glorifies God in the person of Jesus Christ. That is our goal, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week, 24-7. And you and I know we fail. But when we fail, his love never fails. Father, we thank you for your provision, what you've already blessed us with, as we've learned through the book of Numbers, as today Pastor Jason will deliver the understanding of abiding faith and walking with you, not against you coming alongside you, not denying you. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray for your blessing upon every might that is submitted to this ministry, to this fellowship. Your love never fails. Amen. Work 
together for my good. You made all things work together for my good. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changing. There may be pain in the night. Joy comes with the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Your love never fails Your love never fails Minister to the heart today, in particular, Lord, that is troubled, heavy laden, not necessarily with sin, but just the burden of life. Deliver us. Deliver us once again, great deliverer. Your love never fails. Amen. Well, good morning. Stand up and greet one another as Pastor Jason makes his way and jazz. I think you can talk after, huh? You want to just take a seat and... So the video will be ready in a minute, ready to go. Let's, uh, you want to take it from here, Pastor? So it's the video, then jazz, and then you go. So let the church know they need to sit down. And then you can Can you? Sure. Cool. It's not mic. Oh, you know what? We can't. Yeah, yeah. Check. Good morning. How you guys doing? Oh, there's a video starting. Anyway, Want to dim the lights for the video? Or? It's a very nice opportunity for the children to learn about Christ by just one simple gift. For Operation Christmas Child, prayer is the glue that holds it all together. And these boxes are going to children around the world who have little to nothing. All right, train leaving your station onto another country to make a difference in a child's life. Operation Christmas Child reaching the farthest places around the globe by sharing this tangible, simple, but powerful gift. It's like God has just come down to them. The love has just been poured on them. She is in heaven. Every box we give out, we try to give out in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to make Christ known uh, to every kid. And uh, we see every year tens of thousands of kids put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Greatest Journey is a 12-lesson discipleship program that many children have the opportunity to participate in after they receive a shoebox. Children are now running to the churches. They used not to go to church on Sunday. Operation Christmas Child, you're bringing life back to the church. So that's just a little bit about what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. Um, my name is Jasmine, and we're going to be putting together a um, shoebox 
for Operation Christmas Child, which is a ministry from uh, Samaritan Purse, which is Franklin Graham's um, uh, organization. So what we're doing is we're having you guys pack shoe boxes, and I've already received one, so thank you very much, those who that didn't. Um, so you can you can pack toys and hygiene products and all sorts of wonderful things. It's an amazing thing to, I know that with Christmas coming, we're all thinking about Christmas and presents and things like that, but these kids don't get anything. And this is just a blessing to them. And it's $7 just for the shipping and handling and the process. Um, if you guys are interested further in the back, there's the actual program, and then inside it says do's and don'ts, what to pack, what not to pack, how to pack it. Um, you pack it uh, separately, like the lid and the actual box itself separately, so that when you close it and open it, they'll be able to open, and they'll kind of sift through your stuff and just make sure that there's nothing perishable or anything that will like explode like in the planes and stuff like that. And it also has these wonderful, it's boys and girls. So you could do two, ages two through four all the way up to 14. And if you really want to get your kids involved, there's these um, really awesome papers in the back where it just says, hi, I, my name is, and it kind of gives a little bit of background about your child. And they can tell you, they can tell the child who received this box, like where they're from. And also there's these, prayer cards in the back so if you guys can't do a shoe box um, and you guys would like to donate some money towards getting supplies for one absolutely you can come to me in the back and um, we're going to be putting together some boxes in groups so if you guys are interested in a packing party like if if there's um, families or youth or children or um, groups that would just like to get together and be able to do a packing party, packing party, come see me in the back and I'll give you more information. God bless. Amen. So I love the OCC, uh, that's what you could call Operation Christmas Child for short, and i uh, been involved with it for many years. And what I really like about it is those boxes, um, they, most of them go out to third world countries and so you could give the kid like a soccer ball and toothpaste and socks and he's going to be pumped up. You know, like here you'd have to give a kid like an iPod to get any sense of like a joy out of him or any response. You know, it'd be like a oh, soccer ball. Nah, I'm never going to use that. You know, but these kids are going to be grateful. It's got the gospel message in it. I mean, how fun would that be to go and deliver those sometime? Um, so, uh, yeah, I talked to Jazz about OCC a while ago. And I'm so glad our church is doing it. That, and it's such a family uh, thing to do for you guys that have families. You get your, your family together. You go to Target or the dollar store or wherever, and you go buy some stuff, put it in a box or two, and then and, and you pray over it, and you, write, you can write letters. And so it's such a good thing to do. I love the fact that they do that. And those boxes go all around the world. And what a witness it is to Christ uh, that the church here in America is doing that and sacrificing a little bit to do it. I mean, come on, you know, to fill up a shoebox from the Target Dollar Center area, you know, is not a lot. You can put something good in there. Uh, you know, probably don't want to put like an iPod though because that might cause problems or something in the country. I don't know. Uh, you know, one kid gets an iPod, the other has socks. Um, anyway, uh, so we, uh, we're in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 16 through 26 is where we're going to be at. Mike Frank's walking the aisle, dealing some Bibles, awesome. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and Mike has got you covered. There's also, if you have a, a smartphone, there's version, a Bible app, it's really good. Um, it's a fantastic app, it's free, and you can take notes on there, you can make a profile, it saves it between all your devices, whatever you download Uversion onto. So it's super helpful. I actually took notes for this study on Uversion, and uh, I just hope it doesn't freeze up again, like last week. Um, so 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for just everybody here, Lord God. I, Lord, you've, you've brought them. Lord God, let you, I pray that you're not confined this morning, God, into the, to the box of, of our minds or, or what we perceive you as. Lord God, I pray that you would be shown for who you are. God, I pray that you would take every word that I may say that may belittle you or speak wrongly about who you are. I pray that you would remove that. God, I pray that you would fill my mouth with words of praise to you, with words that are true. God, with words that are right. God, with things that you want to say, Lord, through your word, through the instruction of your word through the giftedness of teaching, Lord God. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word this morning, Lord. I pray that's what we came for, and maybe not, but I pray you would do it anyway, Lord God. And I thank you for this morning. What a beautiful morning you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. So a quick FYI, there is an impromptu youth fundraiser after service. Um, it just got... It's wheels in motion this morning, and uh, as, as Chuck Smith liked to used to say, uh, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. So uh, we're doing that, and we just, you know, it's, it's spaghetti. It's made by, uh, uh, Denise made it, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> don't worry, your reward is still in heaven, as long as you don't gloat. Um, but we, it's, it's, it's just going to be a blessing for the youth, uh, you know, if you want to eat after, it's uh, probably five bucks a plate or something, or, or donation, whatever you feel led to give, and it's going towards winter camp, uh, winter camp is set, we actually had to choose with the youth group this year, we had like two cabins offered to choose from, so it was like we had choices, and uh, so we're excited about where we're going, uh, we're excited and hoping that we can all fit. Um, and uh, I, th I think we can. I think it's going to be a good time. And all the uh, fundraising activity and funds uh, go to, to brand new shoes for me. No, I'm just kidding. They go, all to, they go all to the youth fund. You know, we don't even touch it. It just goes towards those kids being able to bring friends or to help them out uh, to go if, uh, if they're in a spot where they can't come up with that uh, dinero. So God is good. Amen. So Galatians 5, 16 through 26, uh, titled this, Organic Christianity, Perseverance Without Preservatives. Verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. So, uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, because time just goes really quick when you have three kids, but, uh, you know, some of you guys know, but it was somewhere in that region, um, my, my wife watched this show on Netflix or something called Food Matters, and uh, how many of you guys eat food in here, by a show of hands? Okay, so, not too many, all right, this is great, um, very responsive crowd, um, but, uh, so it was called Food Matters, and it was talking about the food we eat. You know, and just where it comes from. I don't know if it's kind of like Food Inc. Anyone see Food, food Inc.? No? Okay. Tough crowd. Uh, so, Food Inc., Food Matters, they kind of like show what the food we eat is. You, you know, if you get a, a frozen TV dinner, you know, what, what is that thing? And what is in my uh, 
Big Mac? You, you know, what does that patty consist of? And just a lot of things we eat because we're busy, right? There's a lot of people in the Bay Area, and we're just, a lot of things are packed full of preservatives to keep them fresher, longer, and looking the same. I used to have a friend that worked at In-N-Out, and they would get McDonald's fries, and they would get In-N-Out fries, and, like, they would set them somewhere, like, in their store. Maybe the manager took them home, and he would do a test. And they would put, put pictures up sometimes, but it, it would show like after months, the McDonald's fries looked the same as they did when you bought them. And the In-N-Out fries are like decaying like potatoes should decay. Uh, and it was the same, like, look at all the preservatives in here, and you're eating them, you know? So, but it went on and it talked about the food we eat, and uh, it kind of freaks you out for a while. Uh, you're kind of like, I need to change the way I eat immediately. Like, it's talking about just all the the stuff you buy, and it's pushing like organic, you know, and organic is defined as um, developing in a manner analogous to the natural growth and characteristic of living organisms arising as a natural outgrowth. And so you would watch these things. I remember watching Food, Inc., and I'm like, uh, okay, I can't eat at McDonald's anymore. Uh, it's tough being a youth pastor, because you know, or Taco Bell. Um, I've broken both those rules, by the way. Because uh, Taco Bell, I mean, come on, especially the one on the beach, if you're surfing, it's like, you know the walkthrough. Um, so I've broken a lot of those things, but it, uh, it, it kind of makes you want to eat healthier and think about what you're putting in and, and kind of stay away from preservatives and aspartame and hydrogenated oils and these things that, you know, some of the people, experts, aren't even sure what they're going to do long term in the body. And so it kind of makes you want to swing toward the organic. And at the end of Food, Inc., I remember it like, because it just takes you through this thing where, like, these cows are all squished in and then they push them out of the factory and they slaughter all of you know, it's just, like, all messy and, you know, there's all kinds of flies around. It's like, that's where we're getting our meat. And uh, then they, like, dip it in, like, Clorox or whatever and then they send it on. You're like, oh, my gosh. Uh, I can't, I, you know, it just kind of shocks you. And I remember at the end, like, it took you to this farm because they're like, okay, what, what's the hope for this? And it takes you to this farm and there's, like, a guy in overalls with no shirt and he's like, raising chickens and slitting their necks and, uh, you know, his kids are running around naked and that was like, that's how we should all live. You know, I remember thinking like, I want to farm, you know, I want to, <laughs> my kids can just run around without clothes and the sun's shining and there's chickens running about and we know they're, you know, not fed all these crazy things and they're natural and they're probably healthier. But of course that's not where we live, but it, it just kind of made, made, made me think about what we eat and what we put in, and this section of scripture right here is very organic as it talks about our, our walk with the Lord, and even walking is something very organic, it's something very healthy, it's something that when we do it, it is good for us, and, and it talks about the fruits of the Spirit that we're going to talk about here as well, and so Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit here, he says, but I say walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, and he talks about how there's these two natures within us, you know, as, as people born into this world, naturally we're born sinners. Psalm 51 says, in, in sin my mother conceived me. We're, we're all DOA, dead on arrival spiritually as we're born into this world. And then when we become Christians, the Bible says the Spirit of God comes to dwell within us and is like another nature that we inherit, but we don't lose the fleshly nature. We, so now we have both. And this talks about their, they're at odds with each other. They're at war with each other. We should starve one and feed the other. You know, we should starve the, the desires of the flesh that we know are carnal and sinful by the word of God. And we should feed the spirit, those things that we should be doing. OCC, I mean, Operation Christmas, what a great way to, to, hey man, maybe you've been like, oh, I don't know what to do with my family. I want to lead them. I want them to be uh, I want us to have a trajectory that is heavenly minded, and what a great way, OCC, so many things to get involved with in a church, in a ministry, and just to be involved and to feed the Spirit, because I was talking to a lady at a, at a Safeway yesterday, and I was wearing this shirt I got, it's a Hurley one, it has a praying hands with a microphone in it, and it's kind of cool, and uh, I thought as a preacher, that's a, kind of a cool shirt, <laughs> praying hands with a microphone, um, and, and uh, that's my desire is to get the gospel out. And so she's like, oh, that, is, that, is that like a gospel shirt? And I was like, I don't know, it's kind of cool. I just, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor, so it's fitting, and it's Hurley, and I like Hurley, you know. And, and she's like, 
oh, she's like, you're a pastor? And I was like, yeah. She's like, so do people come to you for spir- spiritual advice? You know, and I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I teach the Bible. And uh, she's like, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people today are spiritual. And I was like, well, we're all spiritual. You, you know, it's kind of, as C.S. Lewis said, you're not a, a soul with a body. Wait, I messed that up. You're not a body with a soul. That's like secondary. You're a soul with a body. You know, this is the tent. This is the temporary. This is going to fade. And we, any, any open casket funeral you've ever been to, you know the soul is out. The, the thing that made them them is, is no longer, and, and no longer there residing in that tent of a body. And she was like, oh, yeah. You know, and it's just, yeah, we're, we're all spiritual. Everybody's spiritual. Cause we're made that way. And, and uh, that we would come to know Christ and have our sin forgiven. And there's a fog around uh, spiritualism because, because of sin. Because it's blinded the eyes of the unbelievers, as Corinthians says, of, of which we, we once were. And it says the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ shines so that we can see Christ for who He is, the Savior of the world, and be born again. And so that we inherit the Spirit of God to then dwell within us. And uh, look at verse 18. It says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And we're just going to kind of go through these quickly. This isn't the focus, but it says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, sexual immorality, the Greek word porneia, from which we get the word pornography. You, you know, that, that's that evident work of the flesh. I've just seen many articles recently just about, there was actually an article written by, um, I forget his name, I don't know if I have it here in my notes, but he was, um, he was an ex-editor of a, of a mag, um, loaded magazine or something, something that portrayed women promiscuously in bikinis or less. And uh, he, said, he, he wrote an article saying that pornography is the most pernicious threat he knows of today. Because he would go around to middle schools, to middle schools, and he would, he would talk to students about what they knew about pornographic terms and everything. And he said they knew, they knew more than he did. There's things I can't even say from here that, that they talked about these kids just like, yeah, everyone knows that. You know, and, and some were saying, you know, I don't really like it, but it's just, you find it, it's so accessible, you know, and, and with the internet, it's just, it's just, nothing's new under the sun, but it's a lot more accessible. And so it's a very real danger, and it's, it's, it's huge. And so um, this is saying it's a work of the flesh. It's not of God. That distortion of sex that's displayed in it is a hijacking of something good. And it's, 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 it says, there's another article that says that actually when people indulge in pornography, it restructures the actual matter of your brain. And if your brain has like trails in it, you know, picture like walking trails that, that you know, say to get pleasure, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a married man, to get pleasure, you know, I'm with my wife, you know, but if, but if you know, pornography, what it would actually do, it, it, would, it would cut that trail off and it would say, no, you need to see this, something crazy, you, you know? And then you could no longer have pleasure as God intended you to, and it would hijack your brain and actually change the physical matter of it. Now, we worship a God who, who made our brain and can renew our minds through the Word of God. Praise Jesus, and He does. But He's saying this is a work of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, having, having anything above the Lord. An idol is anything in your life that's above the Lord. Is Jesus the one you worship? Is that evident by how you live? Because if there's any idol, it's called idolatry. And you're worshiping something that is, is not Christ. You're putting something above. And for us in our modern culture, you know, it's not like usually a statue or something. Or when you go eat Chinese food, sometimes they have that waving cat or, or whatever. You know, it's not typically a, a thing like that. But it's, it's usually ourselves. You know, that we're worshipers of ourselves, Second Timothy says in the end times, that people are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure. And they're going to have a form of godliness, but deny its power. It says flee from such people. And so, idolatry, sorcery, um, which is like witchcraft. And um, I believe the Greek word 
for that is, is, is pharmakia, from what we get pharmacy, talking about drugs, mind-altering drugs, that they alter the state of our, our mind is, is sinful because God wants you to operate sober. And, so, you know, I, and I used to do some drugs, so I can know that sometimes it's fun for a little bit, but it deteriorates ultimately. And there's some drugs now, I just read about a drug called Molly that's just slaying the brain cells. And it's crazy, and people are doing these things. I had friends that did ecstasy in high school, I remember, and then this article came out, and my friend was like, I think I have a, a hole the size of a quarter in my brain by what this article is saying because of how much ecstasy I did. I'm like, well, at least you can still read the article. <laughs> you, you know, but just the things that we do that we think are so fun, and they're destructive. God's saying, don't do these things. These are not my intention. These are works of the flesh. Enmity, strife. Just always being uh, rough with people, jealousy, being jealous of other people, looking at what other people might have, and just that, that ugly being, uh, being green with envy and jealousy is not a good thing for the soul. It's not healthy at all. Fits of anger, how we could get so angry so quickly, that's a work of the flesh. Um, rivalries, dissensions and divisions, envy, drunkenness, just being wasted. You know, I follow Lecrae on Instagram, and he's making a new video, and he, he had a screenshot of it, and he said something like, if this is your idea of a good time, I'm sorry for you, and had all those, you know, had a bunch of booze on the table, and people just kind of passed out and everything, and I'm like, I love Lecrae, man. He's reaching such, you know, such truth that needs to be heard right there, because some people think that's a good time. And it might be for a little bit, but then the consequences come, and they overwhelm it quickly. And so he's saying, orgies, um, and things like these. These are works of the flesh. They're evident. They're not the way God wants us to live. They are leading to death. And he says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You could be like, uh-oh, I've done some of those. Don't worry. In the Greek right there, it says, it, it, it has a meaning of those who practice these things. If that's like your lifestyle, if your lifestyle is involved in any of those, then you're to be warned. And we're to be warned all straight up, but if like you're practicing those, and many of those I've done, you know, it's like, but I don't practice them, and I don't want to. I'm not perfect by any means, but those things do not categorize my life, and they shouldn't for any believer, for anyone walking in the Spirit, they shouldn't be like the mark of who we are. And verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So then he changes gears. So he says, hey, these are things we shouldn't have, but let me show you what we should have, okay? And these are good. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And I like that because it... it talks about fruit, that it's fruit, you know, and, and many cool things we're going to look at about fruit, just how the analogy that, that God gives to these good things that should be from our life being fruit, that, and that there is no law. It's not like a mechanical thing that we're trying to manufacture and, oh, I got to get this right, got to get this right. Yeah, there's discipline in the Christian life for sure, but it's, it's a fruit. It should be the natural outgrowth of our walk with the Lord. These things should be evident to us. And uh, so let's look at them uh, real quick. Love. Love is agape love talked about here. Selfless. Love of choice. Not emotional or physical. It's not based on, on just the momentary. It's like committed. Okay? Agape love is like I'm committed to you. Okay? It's, a, you know, all, it's the love of God to us. It's also kind of seen in the selfless love of a mother to her, her baby, you know. We just had a new one of those, you know, he's 10 months old now, but you know how the mom will, or you know, and my, my wife will wake up in the middle of the night several times, you know, because he's screaming, and it's that selfless love of that giving, and this should be something that, that marks our life as Christians. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. If we worship Him, love should mark our lives. 
But the world speaks a lot about love and what love is and what love isn't. Many songs are sung about love and there may be some misconceptions as to what love is. Maybe in the world sometimes it's based on some uh, attractiveness or, or something temporary like that or it's maybe emotional and it's the goosebumps or something like that. But, but there's a general understanding of what love is. Even in the world when love is seen, it's clear. Because I don't think we can make sense of, of love without God. He, he gives meaning to all these things. And so love, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And the transcendent depth of love makes most sense in our Christian worldview, which is what we see. Love is elevated everywhere. Right? You've got to have love. All the world needs is, is love. It says in so many ways. So it is everything. And I love 1 Corinthians 13.8. Maybe you have a placard in your house of this one. Uh, you know, some of these verses, like this whole section of verses, to be completely honest, I didn't want to teach on it at first because I'm like, ah, oh, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. You know, it's just like it, it kind of can become cliche. It, it could get old to us as we hear it again and again. We see like uh, a quilt, you know, with, with these verses. And we're just like, oh, yeah, those are... Those are happy verses. Those are good. You know what I mean? But they're really good. Like, you know, as I've been studying, I'm like, man, no, I just really feel like the Lord's directing me to share on these because we need to have these. We need to have these. And maybe, maybe you could agree with me because in studying this, it's been like there's, there's kind of something wrong here because these fruits of the Spirit, like I see some of those things in, in, in unbelievers that don't know the Lord. And then there's believers where I'm like, I don't see those. And I'm like, what's going on? There is, I believe, a strong call the Lord wants to give of like, we need to have these. Like, these aren't optional. Like, "Eh, maybe I'll have the fruits of the Spirit today or maybe I'll try and be loving or, you know. No, this should be the natural outflow of our walk with Jesus. If you're walking in the Spirit, you will have these. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As we sung this morning. Your love never... Beautiful song. Okay? And something you might want to try here in 1 Corinthians 13, if taking notes, something you might want to try is plug your name in there. Where Every time it says love in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, Jason suffers long and is kind, does not envy, does not parade himself, is not puffed up, does not behave... You know, it's like, ah, okay. okay I see what I got to work on here. You, you know, always rejoices in the truth. You know, and it, it's an easy, quick, applica- applicable way to say, am I loving? Is this fruit evident in my life when I put my name here in 1 Corinthians 13? Because you put Jesus' name there, does it work? Works in spades, right? It works really well. And we should be shining like him. We should be being conformed to his image, the image of the Son of God. Romans 5.5, 5, look at this, Romans 5.5 5, uh, says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. There's no love. It's like, hey, God's poured love into our hearts. Like, you know, like when you go to a restaurant, hey, you want refills on that? Yeah, hook me up. You know, I want, more, I want as many free refills as I can. You know, I'm going to get my money's worth of this drink. You know, and and it's just like that pouring in that the Holy Spirit's done that. He's poured the love into our hearts. So this should be an evident fruit from our life. Uh, We can look at, yeah, I just got thrown off. My watch says 12.02. Did anyone get freaked out by the time change this morning? I was completely blindsided by it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm late. You know, I'm like, and then I, I look at my phone, I'm like, What's going on? I, no idea. I just, I don't know. I had no, I totally forgot. Like usually it's like people are talking about it. Anyway. But I was glad in the end because I got an extra hour of sleep. Like most of you guys. After a panic attack. Okay. So the next one. 
And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Ah, joy. There's just so much to be said here about joy. A quick, a quick uh, acronym, shared it with the youth, and it's just super memorable. Justice, let's see him. Remember it? It's good, huh? So it's for joy, to see joy displayed in your life. J-O-Y, just think Jesus, others, and you. In that order, and that displays joy. Like, it's kind of cliche, too. And like, oh, yeah, I've heard that a lot. But I'm like, okay, I'm going to really live that out. Put Jesus first, and then others next. And then, my, you know, then myself. You kind of forget about yourself when you're busy serving the Lord, you're busy serving others. And let me tell you, every time I've done that, or when I try and live that way, there's joy. There's joy. It's like you're operating in the way you were made to operate. It's like the Bible knows what it's talking about. And you're like, man, that is good. So joy is not necessarily happiness, which is based on happenings or what's going on around you. Okay? Joy is rooted in that which changes not Christ. Hebrews 13.3 says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He doesn't change. So if your joy is rooted in Christ, which doesn't change, should your joy change? It's a question. No, right? It shouldn't change, right? Because he doesn't change. And our joy should be found there. It doesn't mean we have to walk around smiling all the time too, by the way. Like, you know, it's not like, ah, I got to work on the smile. You know, your cheeks are burning and they're cramping up, you know, but there should be a joy there in your life that should be evident as fruit is evident, and I want to read a quick verse, Habakkuk 3, 17, verse 3, 17 to 18. This is a really cool verse. It says, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. That's biblical joy. That's joy that no matter what's going on, even contrary to what's going on, it's firm. It's secure. And we should have this joy in our lives. And it should be winsome to people when we tell them about Christ and who he is. So it's the choice to rejoice. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send the portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You know? If, if the, man, that is such a defense for us as we walk through this world full of hurts and pains and corners we can't see around, you know, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. And it would be evident. The book of Philippians, the whole thing is about joy. Because Paul wrote it from where? A prison, a jail cell, right? They probably didn't have flat screen TVs in it either, like some might today, okay? It was a Roman prison, probably smelled like pee and, and urine, and it was concrete and small and, and just filthy and gross and cold and all these things. But it, Paul talks in Philippians, the word joy is used so many times, and rejoice in Philippians 4.4. 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So he's saying, hey, rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case you're like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. He says, again, I say rejoice. He made the choice to rejoice. So joy should mark us. Peace right here. Ah, peace. Peace is the inner calm resulting in your saving relationship with Christ. Knowing that you're saved, that you're His, that you're secure, that when you breathe your last tear, you will be with Him forever as the Bible declares that we stand upon the rock of His truth. Again, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That God offers a peace in the midst of any storm, and it's a peace that surpasses understanding. He's saying, hey, you're not even going to understand it. Okay, but there's a peace that God offers. And don't try and figure it all out and break it down all calculus style. Look, you're not going to understand it. But you should have it. Patience, or your version might say long-suffering, is the willful endurance of, with others, especially in the face of mistreatment. Who modeled that perfectly? Jesus, right? Don't you see how these all point to Christ, to who he is, yet they should be evident in our life? They, they, they must be, guys. They must be as believers. Because I was struggling with that. I'm like, man, there's people that don't love Jesus that seem to display some of these, and people that do that don't. That shouldn't be. And then I looked in the mirror. I said, that shouldn't be. Man, I got to display these. I might be like, well, I'm just not a loving guy. No, <laughs> scratch that. Oh, my dad wasn't loving. What? Come on. You've been born again, dude. Get up. See what you are. See what your identity is in Christ. And patience. This is very needed in our world where we breathe ADD. It's in the air, baby. It's, you know, YouTube, they got to put videos two minutes now because they're saying, hey, anything longer than two minutes, people just don't want to watch it. You know, you probably all had the situation. Hey, dude, check out this video. It's life-changing. It's the greatest video I've ever seen. How long is it? Five minutes. Ah, don't got that kind of time. You know, it's like, well, it'll change your life. Like, 10 years ago, you would have had to, like, write code to see this video or pay money. It's now on your phone, you know? It's just like, busy, you know? And, and that's how we are. I've done that so many times. Like, hey, check this out. It's really good. Five minutes, dude. Come on. Come on. Got a lot going on. And uh, we're just so busy. And this patience, this long-suffering, just being someone that's patient, that's not so quick to speak, that we'd be slow to speak and quick to listen. I've heard it said that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. In that ratio, <laughs> you know, that we would listen twice as much as we speak. And uh, that we really listen to. It says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of, who, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. So he says that Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So he displayed long-suffering. He said, hey, this is a pattern for you now to live in. People are going to wrong you. Things are going to happen out of your control. You know what you do? Is you play the only hand you're dealt, and that's how you respond. You don't let what anyone else does control what you do and how you respond. You live like Joseph who was sold into slavery, who was mistreated, who was sent to prison wrongly. And you know what? He'd be like, ah, God, you're, man, I'm all messed up. Serving, trying to serve you, not going to prison again. No, he became the best prisoner there was and started running that thing. And the guy's like, here, I'll give you the keys to everything. Just don't escape, but, you know, just keep tabs on everything. Because he was the best prisoner and the best slave. And God honored that. But even if he didn't, he would be with the Lord. And he would know him all the more. Right? Philippians says that, that man, we would know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share with him in his sufferings. His sufferings. Kindness. Kindness is the tender concern for others. Are you, are you tenderly concerned for others? It's one I struggle with the most, like kindness. This sounds so soft. But kindness, are we, are we really concerned for others, for the, the well-being, for the sake of others? Yes, for this life. Man, we want people to get gifts and have running water and, and all kinds of things. And we want people to be taken care of and to be fed and all this. But do we have tender concern for people eternally? That you are not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body. That we would have concern. 
2 Timothy 2.24 says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Talking about the servant of the Lord, gentle, not quarrelsome, able to teach, patient, humble. Goodness is the next one. Goodness. My goodness. Moral and spiritual excellence. So we're not naturally good, the Bible says, but we've been given this bank account and these resources to be good, to walk in good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. He says, hey, God has good works for you guys. You just got to walk in them. You know, it's like the dance steps are laid out on the floor. All you got to do is, oh, right here, left foot, right foot. You know what I mean? You just got to walk in them. They're laid out, and they're going to be good. And God wants to work in you and through you for you to be his, his workmanship. And we exemplify goodness because he is good. Amen? He is good. In chapter 8 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia, right? Um, Mr. Beaver is trying to describe what Aslan, he's the lion figure in, in, lion, in, in Narnia, and Aslan is a, a, he's a type of Christ in, in those books, type of Christ, you've seen him, he's like awesome looking, um, and, and uh, so he's trying to, to describe what Aslan is like, and Susan, one of the characters, jumps in to ask, is he quite safe, you know, and she asks it like that, you know, it's accent, and and uh, is he quite safe? Because he's trying to describe like the awesome majesticness of Aslan, 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 whatever. And uh, Mr. Beaver replies, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. And how, that captures Christ, that captures God. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. And I love that. That's the greatest line in Narnia. You know, it's the best. If you haven't seen it, I'm sorry. It's the greatest line. But uh, watch it, and you can see Aslan and his CGI main. It's really good. Um, so goodness. We exemplify goodness because God is good, and we want to display that to the world, that he is good. Faithfulness. Loyal and trustworthy. 49er fans, uh, they have, uh, how are the 49ers doing? Is there, are they winning? Huh? Six and two. Okay, that's, I used to be like a football fanatic, but I don't really follow it much anymore. Um, so uh, they, they got the signs, right? That is, what do the signs on the freeway say? 49 are faithful, right? Faithful. Got to be faithful. Gold-blooded, right? And, uh, and I remember I have, I have this video called Step in the Liquid. It's a surfing video. I was talking about a guy who surfed every day of his life. And he lives somewhere in NorCal. He's like, and he's like a, an older guy now. And he surfed every day from like he was like, he made a decision when he was like 20 or something like that. Oh, I'm going to surf every day, bro. You know, and as much as I like surfing, I'm like, this dude is, yeah, he's super faithful, but he like lives in a trailer on the beach and like doesn't really know his daughter and his family's in shambles. And he just has all these, he had a ball of wax like this big, old wax from the surfboard. You know, I'm like, He's faithful, but as much as I like surfing, this guy's an idiot. That is, that is foolish. He's wasted his life. So we're to be faithful to the right things. We can be faithful to so many things. And there are so many 49er faithful. And I love sports as much as the next person. I love to play them more, not follow them, as you know, I don't know the schedule. But, but what, are we, what are we really going to be faithful to? And we're the faithful men and women of the church and of Christ. And for his glory and for his name, saying, I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. I'm going to be faithful to my marriage. I'm going to be faithful to my kids. I'm going to be faithful to my job. I'm going to be faithful because he is faithful. And when I'm faithless, he's still faithful because he can't deny himself. When are we going to rise up and, and be faithful for Christ? And I want to encourage us. And I know many of you guys are faithful. You model it. And I want that to be an encouragement. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're like, not there. And you're faithful to so many other things. And I want to 
encourage you as well and challenge that, that God wants you to be faithful for the right things. Because we know how to be faithful for things we know how to be. People sit in the frozen tundra with cheese on their heads because they're faithful. Right? People know how to be faithful to things, that we would be faithful to Christ. Gentleness is, 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 uh, is, a, is the next one. Gentleness, it's a meekness, not a weakness. Okay? It's, it's being meek. And being meek and gentle is, a, is strength under control here. It's a strength that's under control. It's like the way I've always pictured it. I don't know why I've always pictured it this way. I don't even know if I heard this from someone. But it's like, like you're at a stoplight, you know, and this like rice burner car that's trying to be really fast pulls up next to like some Corvette, you know, that could just V12 dust it, you know. And it's like, you know, and it peels off and like thinks it's winning and the Corvette just, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the speed limit, whatever, you know. When, the, when it could destroy it, right? It could be no contest. But it's like the strength under control, you know, and that's what we are to have and to model. And Philippians 4, 5, check this out. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I love that verse because it's like, why be, why be gentle? Why have the strength under control? See, God doesn't want us to be weak. He wants us to be meek. He wants you to be strong, but to have it in control. And he says, let your gentleness be, be, be evident to all men. The Lord is at hand. Nothing should move you, should shake you. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Right? Isn't that Christ before the trials and before the beatings and before everything? Gentle, meek. Why? Because the Lord's will was being done. The Lord, the Lord is at hand. The last one here is self-control. And it's a restraining of, of, of passions and desires. Fleshly passions and desires may be that that could disqualify you in, in your walk with the Lord or could uh, uh, trip you up for what God has for you. And it could even be, be, be good things, you know, that maybe you're putting above the Lord. You're putting in front, of, in, in front of your service to the Lord, your devotion to God. And he would say, no, have self-control. Have self-control. We live in a day and age where people are saying, hey, true freedom is doing whatever you want to do. Spreading your wings. Whatever you want, do it. Go for it. Be with them. Leave your marriage. Do this. Whatever makes you happy. That's junk. It's a lie. Proverbs 25, 28 says this. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. I love that picture. It's like a city broken down without walls. That God... Man, he, he wants us to have walls for the right things because we live in a fallen and broken world and we're fallen and broken ourselves. And he says, no, I have a way that's right. But let me tell you, you're going to have to put some walls up. You're going to have to put some walls up. I know as a married man, I've got to put some walls up because I want to be faithful. I want to display these things. I want to live like Jesus. I, wanna, I don't want anything I do in my life to hinder the gospel and one more person to be able to say, oh, you Christians, see, you're just like everybody else. Why do I need that? I don't. I don't want, I don't want to give cause or reason for one more person to say that because so many can. Sadly. And God wants these fruits to be built up in us and them to be evident and, and, and for people to see. So a few quick, quick, quick closing points on these and about fruit in general and how it relates and just some cool things I think that will be helpful is one, opt for organic. And I'm, I'm talking about fruits of the spirit. I'm not like, oh, this is an organic apple. It's like 50 cents more. I, bought, I would buy the regular ones. You know, I'm food-wise. Organic's better though. So this is where I'm going. Organic is better, you know, but Lord, keep me here however long you want me to. Uh, you know, if I can get organic, I can get it. If I can't, I can't. But, but spiritually, opt for organic. Don't be fake. There's a reason God used fruit. It's the natural out, outflow. Fruit can be described, defined as anything produced or accruing, a product, result, or effect, return, or profit, the fruit of one's labors. Right? So it's the natural product. Okay? It just should grow. 
I've decided not to shave for a while. And that's evident, right? The natural product. You know, it's just, it's just gross, you know? And it's just like, all right, I'm going to let it grow. I've never let it grow out before, but here we go. February. So it's going to get gnarly. Um, these should be the natural product of our life. And like I said, these, these shouldn't be, these are not even optional for us as Christians. It's not like, oh, the fruits of the Spirit, yeah, those are cool. I'm not even going to memorize them, though, because there's like nine of them. No, dude, memorize them and live them and be them and look at them and examine yourself and be like, man, do, am I displaying these? Where are these displayed in my life? How am I displaying love, joy, peace, patience? You know, break it down. Take a yellow notepad and go today or tomorrow and like have in your devos, man, how am I displaying these? And where can I display them further? God, where do you want it? Because we all could use work. All of us, all of us could use work, okay, in these areas. Because we're always under construction. We'll be under construction until the day we die, okay? And none of us are going to be perfect here. But let us be under construction. Let God be doing something good. Something I love about the Bible College campus that I went to for a semester was that everywhere you went, it was so beautiful. But then there was always an area under construction. You're like, oh, I wonder what they're building there. You know, and it's roped off and stuff. And then, then they would get done and be like, oh, my gosh, look at that. It's another fountain, you know, or whatever it was. But it's like, oh, my gosh, it's so cool. And then there'd be another area. And you'd be like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. You know, roped off the orange cones, the whole thing. And that's how our lives should be. Because what if someone tried to sell you an apple tree and was like, hey, here's, you know, this is a good apple tree and it's going to be great. You're going to love it because you want an apple tree. You plant it, you water it, it's growing up. You know, what are you going to go look for year after year? Apples, right? You're going to be like, and if there's no apples, you're going to be like, that charlatan, this isn't an apple tree. And you're going to take it out and put a real apple tree in there. Fruits should be evident in our lives, they should be evident. So maybe you don't see fruit in your life. And I would say, maybe you're not connected to the vine. John 15, John 15, 5 says, Jesus speaking says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that you would repent and give your life to Christ this morning and be connected to the vine and find everlasting life and be in relationship with the Savior of the world. Because that's what He came for. He came for us. He came to restore sinful humanity to a holy God. And that your life would begin to bear these fruits. They would be the natural outflow. Maybe these things you want in your life, but you've been trying to force them and kind of manufacture them and, and wear this plastic smile or, or go through the motions, but on the inside, and when things hit the fan, these don't hold true. And they're fake. And they're pump full of preservatives. And I would say the same. Trust Christ. Be real. Do business with your Creator. Confess your sin to Him. Put your faith and your trust and your hope in Him. So Christ wants us to be real for organic. Sometimes organic stuff looks worse than the non-organic. Because we live in a world where we want stuff to look good for a long time. And Botox and the, you know, the whole thing. But organic often doesn't look good because it's real. And the bruises are there. And sometimes it's shaped all weird. You know, you, you get some organic fruits and you're like, that doesn't look like a pear what I drew in school, you know. But it's a pear. It's a real pear, you know. And it's, it's real. And, and, and we should be. We should opt for organic. Number two is uh, you're you're on it, bro. Thank you. I totally forgot to give you the wink. You are not a tree. No, I was informing you guys. I don't know if you knew, but you're not a tree. So you're welcome. Uh, you're not a tree. 
So a tree typically bears one fruit, one, one type of fruit, okay? And I would say be diverse. And every analogy ultimately breaks down, and the fruit one eventually will, but it's, it's, it's good. It's going to hold up through these. And it, so bear all these fruits in, in, in clusters. All these different types of fruits, bear them all. We're made to bear them all. You know why? Because in the Greek, it doesn't even say fruits plural. It says fruits singular. All these things are to be there. It's not like, um, um, you know, I got this and that, but man, self-control, forget about that. That's way out the window. <laughs> no. It should, it's the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says. All these should be evident. Though they are diverse, they should be evident and bring unity into our soul and into our walk. So what are evident in your life? And I would challenge you to cultivate those. Cultivate them. And farming business is hard work sometimes. Sometimes you want that tree to grow and bear fruit. It's going to take some work. The natural outflow should be the fruit, but sometimes you've got to tend the soil. You've got to dig the hole a little deeper. You've got to water it a lot more for it to bear fruit. Number three, so there's a greater reality. Fruit's pretty genius. Because it's, it encompasses a greater reality. What's inside this fruit? Nourishment. Nourishment. What? Plant. Seed, right? There's a seed in here. There's a seed in here that by design, every fruit naturally, I know we like make a lot of seedless fruits now, but those are man-made and manipulated. And every, every fruit has a seed, and, and it's made to live beyond itself, to get that seed out and planted and bear more fruit other places. That's why you are called to have fruit in your life, okay? You're not called to have fruit to just enjoy it to yourself. No, it's for others. And guess what? There's a seed in there that the fruit of the Spirit embodies the seed of the gospel that God wants to get out into the world. You know, and they, they see your life, and they see the fruits. You're like, oh, that is good. That's sweet. It's some, what was that, some nectar? You know, it's, it, there's sweetness. There's nourishment. And the, people will see that from your life, but then guess what? They get to the seed, and you give them the seed of the gospel. And then they're going to be like, oh, you Christians are so fake and phony. And they're going to be like, huh, maybe there's something, there's something to this. Because your life speaks louder in your words. But when your life speaks the same thing as your words, that's powerful. It's been said, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. I think that's unbiblical. Somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> yes, I know what it's saying. Live it. Yes, amen. But you, we got to use words. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. We got to combine those two. I do like the quote and the fact that what it's saying is, hey, live it. Yes, amen. But look, at, we got to have words as well. And I'm telling you, when you combine both of those into the fruit that God wants to, to produce in your life, it's powerful. We need to be sharing the gospel with dying people, and it's so simple. We all know, but we struggle with it. Me as well. Man, I, I burn to share the gospel so much, and I fail so much. And my wife told me a story of, uh, she was at the store, and it's, it's child logic. And, and there was all these dead skeleton things and all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, Christian was just like, well, Mommy, do these, people, do these people love Jesus? And she's like, I don't know. He's like, well, why, why don't they love Jesus? Like, you know, because he knows us and you guys and... You know, he's like, most people in his life love Jesus, right? And he's like, why, why don't these people love Jesus? And, and my wife's like, maybe they haven't heard. And he's like, mommy, you've got to tell them. And there he is, at the, they're at the checkout. And, uh, you know, the lady's coming up, and my wife's telling me the story. And he's looking up like, mommy, you going to tell her? And my wife's like freaking out, like, oh man, uh, 
yeah, I really should, huh? But I'm just buying groceries, and I wasn't all prepared to get all apologetical. You know, it's just like, and there's people in line, and, and we can all relate, but he's sitting there. Isn't that right? Like that, tell him. You know, and so often I want to tell him, I'm like, nice day, huh? Yeah. These apples look good. You know, it's just like, we talk about anything else, but then it's like, man, I really want to share the gospel. It could be so hard. You know, sometimes we, we need to just tell them. You know, wear, get a shirt with praying hands and a microphone. Maybe that'll open up the door. I don't know. It's kind of why I got the shirt, so I'm glad that worked. You know? But we need to tell them. And number four, number four is uh, just replenish. Fruit can't keep this line around for weeks and expect it to be good. You've got to replenish it. You've got to keep it coming in. Right? That's what I love about the analogy of fruit. It's one of my favorite things, well, besides the other three. But is that you've got to replenish it. You've got to stay fresh. You've got to use it and then get more and then use it and then get more and use it and then get more and stay fresh. And you've got to have your devos. You're not going to bear fruit if you're not in the Word of God. You're not. You may go on a spirit, you may go on some trip or some retreat, and it's awesome, man. You feel like, man, oh, yeah, there's this fruit, man. I just feel like, God, man, God wants me to do these things. But guess what? You leave that lying around for weeks on the counter without ever getting in the Word, it's going to die. It's going to rot. It's going to get moldy. You're going to throw it away. It, you know, it's, what, it's, it needs to stay fresh, guys. We need to replenish manna in the Old Testament. Look at, God had the Israelites supernaturally provided for by manna that would be there in the morning, like these little Krispy Kreme donut things on the ground. And they would be there. And he said, hey, don't, don't take enough for tomorrow. Only take enough for today. And you got to get it every day. And there's a principle to that, that in our spiritual walk with Christ, we need it every day. Look, I can't rely on my devos or the message from Sunday or Wednesday to, to help me out on Friday or Tuesday uh, it's not going it to, might, it might help, but you know what? I need it every day. God's designed us every day that we would be getting the manna, every day that we would be in the devos, every day, every day. And this, I, I believe this is becoming more foreign to people. They're like, every day in the Bible? I'm not like a super Christian. What? Where did these terms come from? Like, gosh, that's like really religious. Who? are you? What are you talking about? You know, why do we have these things? Like, look, at, do you eat every day? Yeah, we do eat every day because we feed the tent. It's going to perish and be gone soon. But the soul, we let starve to death? What, are we insane? We need every day. We need the Word. Or this can't be foreign to us. Man, more than once a day. Come on. More evening and morning, whenever that we would spend Time in the Word every day. I struggled with this for decades of having consistent devos in my life. And I had a friend go to the military, and he was bought at a price. He became a government-issued soldier. You know what? His life changed. His schedule changed. Because he wasn't his own. I'm like, huh, Corinthians says, I'm not my own. I've been bought at a price. Yeah, I'm lazy and not getting in the Word and acting like I'm my own. No, I've been bought at a price. I'm like, I need to change some things. I need to get up earlier than maybe I have to already get up early. You get up earlier. Look, you're going to find time for what you need. And maybe you don't think Bible reading or time in the Word is something you need. It's something you need. And I pray God would bring us to that realization that it's something we need, not want. But hopefully it is something we want. I don't want you to not want it either. Like, oh, gosh, got to read this thing. You know, man, when I'm reading and having devos, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. I've read this like ten times, but right now, intersecting with where my life is at, dude, it's so fresh. And I needed this, and I needed this. And, God, we need your word. So realize it's something you need and hopefully something you want. I love Psalm 119. I'm in Psalm 119 right now in my devos. And I love Psalm 119. He says this, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, meaning your word, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law, meaning your word. 
Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, meaning your word, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, meaning your word, and do not, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your judgments, meaning your word, are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, meaning your word. Revive me in your righteousness. Man, I love that. It awakens something in my soul when I read that. There's times, guys, I don't want to read the Bible either. Or it seems boring compared to the billions of videos available on YouTube. Your soul is going to starve on YouTube. Only in the Word will things be awakened. And as I have consistent devos, I'm like, what have I been missing that God wants to do in my life all these years, I've been struggling to have consistent devos. I've always known, man, I need to get in the Word daily. But it just wasn't a priority. And things we really care about, we're going to make time for. Don't fool yourself. You're not too busy. You're not. No one in here is too busy. You will make time for what you really care about. And I know we're all busy. But you'll make time. And I, 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 I better make time. Because I'm not going to live as I ought if I'm not spending time with the Lord through His Word, having His Word revive me, having these fruits be replenished daily, and having this work be done in my life. So to sum it all up, Jesus. Hashtag Jesus. It's, it's all about Jesus. All these things point to Him. Where we get our fruit, where we get our energy, why we should do it, who's worthy, everything boils down. We're made to know Him and to make Him known. And I pray that when you would look at these fruits, I pray you would go through these fruits this week and just be like, Lord, what, what do I need to work on here? Because these aren't even optional, guys. I'm so tired of... And I'm just so, sometimes all of us, I'm not saying anyone in particular, for sure. Just when I look at the church as a whole sometimes, it's like, man, these, these are to be like fruits of the Spirit, supernatural. So when it says love, it's not just like, hey, cool, man. And as long as I'm cool with someone, I'm going to love them. No, it's like if they slap me in the face, I'm going to love them. And would I? Would I really? Don't, don't try it after, please. But, you know, like, man, these are to be real and deep. And I'm, gonna, I'm to understand these. And these are to be evident, man, in my life. And though, man, that they would be evident in our lives. You know, and I see so, many, so much fruit in you guys' life. And this message is always relevant because fruit, it needs to be replenished. We all need it replenished all the time. And do that for the sake of the Lord and His kingdom that never perishes, that never fades, that never gets old and will never be overtaken by any tyrant. That we would live for that. Live for these fruits. That they would be evident in our life. That we'd encourage one another with them. Or if we, if we see a lack. If we see a lack in someone, hey, I just want to encourage you in this in this uh, you don't seem very peaceful you know you're always anxious it seems like where's the peace it's to be a fruit you know and some someone might say hey well the Bible says don't judge me lest you be judged bro you know it's the verse people love to throw out don't judge us lest you be judged and, but guess what it's, it's Matthew 7 verse 1 but in verse 5 Jesus gives us an instruction First, we make sure we don't have a plank in our own eye. Make sure we can see clear that we've checked ourselves, And then we can see clearly to remove the speck in our brother's eye. You know, and, and so that we would do that. And uh, 
Father, I just thank you for your word. God, I thank you for, Lord, these fruits that you want Lord, to be the natural outflow and product of our lives. God, and I pray that you would do it, Lord. Lord, I pray it wouldn't feel like we're just trying to manipulate it, Lord, that we would just seek you, Lord. In your word, God, ask your Holy Spirit to conform us, to, to mold us, to shape us, to give us a desire for these things, Lord, and that you would, and that they would be good, Lord, and that, that we would realize all these fruits, Lord, are for the purpose that we got to get this seed out. The seed of the gospel. we got to get the gospel out to people that are dying. Everyone, everyone, everyone around us is dying. All of us, Lord, and the, the fruit is only so good because it embodies the seed that is so needed and that we would proclaim your truth and proclaim your gospel and that our life would match up with everything we say, God, that we would be real, God, Lord, that we would replenish, that we would deal your word and Love people, Lord, to get it out to the ends of the earth, whether it be through a shoebox or we could send to a kid who it might change his whole life or whether it might be to our brother or sister who we've been at odds with for so long and there's just been this built-up strife or a parent or someone around us. God, I pray, Father, that we would walk in the Spirit and that these fruits would be evident, Lord and that you would be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask the um, Phil. You and Shiva would be willing, and Mike. Phil and Shiva are going into the lobby for the parents with young children. Right? We got that? Do you have elements out there? Great. So here's what we're doing. The most of you can remain here if you desire to take, partake of uh, communion. And we're releasing the parents to go and fetch their children now. Let's do that. And Phil and Shiva, Phil's one of our elders, he'll be out in the lobby to minister to you the elements. The rest can remain here. You are not mandated, required to be here. Uh, this is a time the communion elements that are provided are scripturally, biblically, established for believers. If you do not know Jesus Christ today, you have a, an amazing opportunity to come to know him as Savior and Lord. And we'll do that in a minute. But other than that, uh, we're going to do a couple of songs. I'll do a couple of songs in worship. If you want to take a quick break, you can do that. But come right back in as we prepare for communion. We'll start in about a minute. Go ahead. Excellent message. Can we drop the lights, please? Hey, big Phil out there. Thank you. So while we're waiting, Jason gave his message. I thought about these two types of corn. By the way, this is an example of what you can start bringing next Sunday, Sunday to Sunday. We are blessing City Impact with canned goods. So... Here's a can good, right? Can of corn. A can of corn. I'm looking for the ingredients, and I guess they got wise because they're not really listing it. What I wanted to see was what kind of preservative is contained therein. A lot of sugar, really? Sucrose, probably, as opposed to fructose. So, as you might assume, this can. It says six grams of sugar. Protein, two grams. Saturated fat, nothing. Trans fat, nothing. 
cholesterol, zero. So have all you want. Knock yourself out regarding cholesterol. Sodium, 8%. And then they've got this mysterious thing called dietary fiber. That comes in at a whopping 12%, church. Anyone here have a clue about what dietary fiber is? I would think that should be the corn, shouldn't it? So uh, anyway, I still love it. I'll still eat it. This was made by God. And what's amazing is this corn is more than 12 months old. We used this last year. I thought I saw Julie. Julie's here? She went, oh, I thought I saw Julie. Julie brought these for the church, and we used them for our Harvest Fest setup, display, whatever. But this corn is still kicking. It's, it's hard. I don't know if you could eat it. But uh, Now, isn't there something called maize that the Native Americans would eat also? So whatever that is, I would say it's close to this. So this is God's best right here, maize. And, and it's still productive. For what? For display? Yes. For, for eating? I'm not sure. I guess if he had to, we could. Then you've got what man's best represents. And this is by Kirkland, which is the Costco uh, product. And they've got corn in here also. So same kind of end product, so to speak, but totally different in how it's presented and preserved. In Jason's message today, the Lord revealed the strong distinction between organic, which in other words is something designed by God, and then preservatives, or artificial, or concocted, or, or uh, hybrid, or whatever it is. It's, it's beyond what God intended. And yes, we're not all farmers, so we need to, we need to part. <laughs> We need to partake of things that are preserved, things that need to put in freezers. Uh, one, of, one of our pastors, Levi Lusco, does a church up in Montana, and he shared with Jason and I that, that they actually buy the whole cow, and then they part it out amongst four or five families. And uh, he says the, the, the taste, and, and without the preservatives, it is incredible. And I, I just think, well, that, that's not something that I'm going to jump on, right? Number one, it's probably not possible here in the Bay Area. Maybe in the outskirts, in, in, at the ranches, uh, if you're going down to Cattlemen's, maybe so. And, and those take, taste pretty good. But ultimately, we have to translate this into a spiritual, actual, organic uh, reality for us as Christians. The story about Christian Fry, amazing, yes? Yes? Do you remember the story? The story is amazing. This kid didn't know any better than to know that he was living in the moment for Jesus. Now, that said, I will always defend Mama Fry, Shannon. She is Miss Evangelist. Well equipped, online, on target, on mark, and, and, and yet that's how we all can become easily caught off guard. We're not prepared. So the distinction today is to draw amongst those of us that profess to know Christ. I'm assuming all of us here know Christ. You'll come and partake of the elements as a result. But also knowing that God, God wants us to live in the moment with him. Because the contrast would be the preservatives of living for the moment without him. Showing up for church, but not listening to the word of God. You show up for whatever other reason other than to connect with God. Now, beyond that, on Sundays, Sunday mornings like these, if you're not showing up and you're doing something else, you can still live in the moment for Jesus. We have families, young families, which I, I encourage and I'm excited about it. They, they, do, they do half marathons. They do sports for their kids. But when they're out there, they're living in the moment for Jesus because they will testify of Christ when necessary, and when opportunity, uh, it, you know, reveals itself. So this is not about showing up on Sundays. Sometimes the issue here on Sundays is there are some of you, you'll show up because you feel that that's your obligation. And that's where you're wrong. 
these Sundays and seven days a week, upon seven days a week, is about oblation, not obligation. Oblation is worship. To worship God is to worship him with oblation. You, you want to worship him in spirit and truth. So in this next few minutes and moments, we're going to work through two worship songs, a couple of three worship songs, and you are welcome to come forward at any time. If you need to leave, you can partake on your own, but at the end of the third worship song, I'll lead you in prayer and opportunity to receive the elements. So prepare your hearts now and worship God out of oblation, not obligation. Father, we come before you. Absolutely acknowledging the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. It is your blood, Lord Jesus, that was shed over 2,000 years ago that not only covers our sins, but removes our sins. We pray in this time that we would refresh our heart, soul, and spirit, that we would come before you with a heart of oblation, not out of obligation or rigid religiosity, that this cup and, and, and this bread is symbolic of your body being broken, the cup representing your blood shed. It is your blood, Lord Jesus that covers us and cleanses us. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood gives me. You may come forward to receive the elements. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice, washes me. God's precious sacrifice It's your blood that cleanses me It's your blood gives me life It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice washes me whiter than the snow and the snow my Jesus
in redeeming sacrifice washes me whiter than the snow than the snow my Jesus God's precious sacrifice I see Pastor David right there that's a good place is is uh Pastor Jason here? Could you ask him to come in and stand? And um, let's also have uh, Pat, are you available? Dan aside, and would you also, when you get your elements, sit up front? We'd love to have the pastors and our leaders. Mary, I see you in the back. Please come forward, front. Along with this partaking of communion, if you have, you have not reconciled with God, and you need assistance in just praying with someone, leadership in our church. We have women and men here at the front row that will pray with you. Come forward. It is your call. It is by your will that you'd be willing to seek prayer, to be prayed for and prayed over as we continue through the next two songs. Near pierced hands, wounded side. This is love. This is love. Holy heart was sacrificed. This is love. This is. Let's sing it again. Nail pierced hands, wounded side. This is love. This is love. Holy heart was sacrificed. This is love. This is love. I bow down. Son of God, Son of God, died for us. This is love, this is love. Walk the hill, bore the cross. This is love. I bow down.
holy heart was sanctified. This is love. This is love. This is love. Father, we come before you acknowledging our great need to be washed of feet. As you yourself said, Jesus, if we are saved and born again, and we call you Savior and Lord, as you spoke to the disciples, it was not necessary, as with Peter, to, to declare that his life be body washed. That was accomplished at the cross, Lord Jesus. And as believers today, we faithfully and lovingly and living in this moment with you, we desire to declare, yes, symbolically, but then to live it out practically, a life in you where we desire not to compromise anymore. Where we become tired of a life of sin and darkness, of compromising, of doing things by light here at church and then going home and doing things by darkness, living off of preservatives of the world, not understanding which spiritual chemicals we're, we're injecting into our whole life system. As Jason shared and Chuck years ago had shared also, good company, Jason, to share exactly what Chuck shared. Pastor Chuck Smith, who aspired to be a physician, he talked about discovering that with the brain when we're young, there aren't as many wrinkles or grooves in our physical, the actual brain. But whenever we capture and maintain a memory, the brain crimps itself and a groove is formed. And that groove of ourselves cannot be removed. It is a trench. And a trench for a living person eventually becomes the crypt, becomes a grave because that's how we live and die. So for those who have come to know Christ and trust in Christ and make him Savior and Lord today, I pray that as we partake of bread and cup symbolic of your sacrifice, Lord Jesus, with it would come your supernatural approval, forgiveness, redemption, cleansing, all that is necessary to take what we want to do here in this moment for you, Jesus, we then want to move out into the world, even amongst our own fellowship, our own kinship of Christ, in Christ, and live like Christians so we can die like Christians and then live forever, live forever with you. At this time, partake of the bread, symbolic of Christ. Not one bone broken in the sacrificial process, but his skin was torn, his back shredded. Pain beyond measure, partake of that bread. And now, partake of the cup, representing his blood shed. How his blood not only covers, but cleanses us forever. We praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I it again. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I will not fail. He is my 
shepherd I am not afraid And the joy of the Lord is my strength Second verse The joy of the Lord Will be my strength He will uphold me And the joy of the Lord is my joy. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my our strength and we admit our weakness being here for the moment with you in the moment with you we embrace your presence and your love and forgiveness thank you for cleansing us Lord Jesus once again thank you for this time it is in your name we pray amen, amen. God bless you we have refreshments. Uh, oh, there's also the fundraiser outside. So uh, partake in that.